You're listening to The Pivot, brought to you by Globally News, where we discuss the leaders, states, networks, ideologies and technologies that are reshaping the world order. Visit our website at globally.news. That's globe, L-Y, dot news. Welcome to episode two of The Pivot. I'm Arif Rafiq, your host. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan is not one to shy away from a challenge. A recurring theme in his public life has been to lead a team of underdogs to success. He did it in 1992 when he led the Pakistani national cricket team to a World Cup victory. And he did it again years later when he established a network of cancer hospitals throughout the country after his mother succumbed to the disease. As a sportsman and as a philanthropist, Imran Khan's record has been a resounding success success. His political career, however, has been a mixed bag. For almost two decades, he was stuck in the political wilderness as his party, the Pakistan Tehreek Insaf, or PTI, failed to gain more than a single seat in parliament. But today, he leads a country of over 200 million people, and it's a challenge unlike any other he's faced before in his life. He's pledged nothing less than to build a Naya or New Pakistan, a Pakistan where the wealthy and the powerful are held accountable, where the poor are afforded the primary health, education, and social services they deserve, and government spending is directed at human development. But the economy he has inherited upon coming into office last August is deeply troubled. Pakistan is in the midst of a balance of payments crisis, and despite aid from friendly countries, it's in need of another bailout from the IMF. An austerity program is already in effect, making the prospects of a new Pakistan even more remote. A period of slow growth and high inflation has begun. So the 66-year-old ex-cricketer Imran Khan has a great challenge before him. In a time of austerity, he must somehow fuel economic growth and human development, but with meager resources. Is he up to the task? Can he lead his team of underdogs to victory again? Again, can his government survive, let alone put the country on the path of becoming a new Pakistan? To discuss these questions, I'll speak with Musharraf Zaidi, a columnist with Pakistan's English language daily, The News, and Salman Masood, the Pakistan correspondent for The New York Times. Now, before we address the question of whether Imran is up to the challenge of governing and reforming Pakistan, it makes sense to chart his rise to power and address the choices and compromises he's made along the way to becoming prime minister. And to do that, we'll rewind to the year 1992. Musharraf Zaidi is now a leading policy expert and commentator in Pakistan, but he came of age in the country in the 1990s. And it's in that very period when Imran Khan transitioned from being a sports superstar into a philanthropist and politician. Here is Musharraf reminiscing on what Imran meant to him and others around that time. 1992 was really etched in the imagination of uh, Pakistanis as kind of the greatest moment in, in history, really, for for, for the country because that's the year that Imran Khan led the Pakistani cricket team to the World Cup victory. It was achieved by a team that wasn't supposed to win. It was really a kind of the classical sort of no hoper underdog story that suddenly emerged out of, out of the ashes of what seemed to be a disastrous World Cup campaign. I think Imran Khan captured the imagination as the kind of leader that this country deserves. The kind of leader that can lead a team that doesn't look like it has it all together just by sheer dint of his will and and his own stellar performance. And then for me, what that meant was as a generation, urban city dwelling, real attachment to Imran Khan. And through the 90s, a lot of us, uh, as we were sort of mid to late teenagers, we went around collecting money for the cancer hospital that he was building and the one that he referenced during his victory speech at the World Cup. By winning this World Cup, personally, it means that one of the, my greatest obsessions in life, which is to build a cancer hospital, I'm sure that this World Cup will go a long way towards completion of this obsession. So for me, he was this sort of larger than life, fully conversant in the West, very popular on the party circuit in London, in Hollywood, in Bollywood, but also relatable as a as a Pakistani, as as somebody who was increasingly more more visible and vocal about his Muslim identity, equally comfortable and equally sort of dominant socially, uh, whether he was walking into a room somewhere in Pakistan or walking into a room somewhere in, in London or New York or LA or, or Mumbai. 
And so really kind of the archetypal Pakistani hero. And it's that image of heroism that Imran sought to leverage when he founded his own political party, the Pakistan Tehreek Insaf, or PTI in 1996. Imran positioned PTI as a third-way political party, serving as an alternative to the country's two major parties, the Pakistan People's Party, or PPP, and the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, or PMLN. During the 1990s, power alternated between these two parties, both of which were accused of rampant corruption. At its founding, the PTI leadership consisted of more or less fresh political faces who were largely unaffiliated with the established political parties. On paper, a fresh crop of politicians sounded appealing, but in the brutal reality of Pakistani politics, it proved to not be a winning formula. Pakistani politics is marked by a high degree of political defections every election cycle. While the army has played a role in shaping some defections, as well as political alliances, the phenomenon of party defections transcends the army's influence. Local notables, who generally come from the landed or business elite, switch between the major political parties in order to get an election ticket or join the stronger horse. So over the generations, there's been a reoccurring cast of characters, many of whom are from the same families and alternate between the major parties. But at its start, the public face of PTI was totally different. It consisted of educated nationalists from the middle and upper middle classes, untainted by accusations of corruption. An agitation against corruption and the political elite is what has driven PTI from the start. Here is Musharraf Zaidi again. I, I think it's absolutely fair to say that, you know, for many, many years, a lot of us didn't give Imran Khan a chance in hell. I mean, he was not supposed to become prime minister. He was supposed to be the kind of idealistic dude on the fringes of mainstream politics that would keep appealing to our better angels. His singular biggest sort of issue, I think, over the years has been has been corruption. And he says that the root cause of Pakistan's problems is systemic, endemic sustained and unrelenting corruption, especially by the political elite. He's been single-minded in the pursuit of that narrative as the basis for his politics. So for roughly 15 years, Imran Khan railed against the corrupt political class, but with little to show for it. Though he was the leader of a political party, politics was a part-time job for him. Here's New York Times journalist Salman Masood on Imran's long transition from being the perpetual outsider to someone who rules. Politics did not seem to be his preference at that time. You know, if I recall the interviews from those days, he always used to spurn the established politicians and he used to say that he did not see himself in politics. But I think gradually in the early 2000s, he started much more activity on the ground. His party, which was formed in the, in the late 90s, but never got any traction. It also started attracting much more people, which are you know, mostly middle class educated people. But even then, in the early 2000s, he did not have electoral success in the, in the parliament. There were elections in 2002. Despite high expectations of his own self and many Pakistanis who wanted change, he did not get any significant number of seats. From those days, you know, he, he, he was not seen as, as a politician or somebody who would be who would succeed in, in politics. He was always seen as an outsider. You know, the former military dictator General Musharraf, he offered Imran to become part of his government. He offered Imran a lot of support, but Imran did not join him at that time. And in 2008, uh, Imran boycotted the elections. So Imran was basically out in the wilderness. And it's only in 2010 and 11 when his message started resonating a lot with, with the with the populace and the electorate. Of course, by that, that time, the political part, the established political parties were not really delivering. There were again a lot of charges of corruption. And the Pakistan's military establishment was also not happy with, with those established politics. Politicians. So in a way, you know, they also started seeing that uh, Imran Khan as an alternate at that time. Gradually, he started getting support from those elements of the state also. And in 2013, he managed to get a substantial number of politicians, uh, his, his party members in the parliament. He, he got hold of the one of the provincial governments in the northwest. And so it's in the northwest province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, or KPK for short.
short that PTI got its first taste of power. While it enacted significant reforms to the provincial police forces and social sectors like education, PTI in many ways also represented a continuation of the status quo. So for example, four relatives of a senior PTI official, Pervez Khatak, are members of the National Assembly. And while Khatak serves as defense minister, his brother Liaqat is a cabinet minister in KPK. He ran for a seat vacated by his brother. Politics very much remains a family business in Pakistan, and that's something that PTI has not been able to change and probably cannot. Now, while falling short of its promise of a revolution, PTI remains popular in KPK. It was the first party since the 1990s to win the province for a consecutive period, breaking a long trend of anti-incumbency. Imran's PTI also broke the control of the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz Party, or PMLN, over the largest province of Punjab. The PMLN had ruled the province since 2008 and its control over the area goes back to the 1980s. Now, PTI was aided in part by political defections said to be induced by the army, and those defections have dramatically changed the composition of PTI. Today, the party is full of turncoats who have defected from its competitors. Many PTI cabinet ministers served in the governments of other political parties that have ruled Pakistan since the early 2000s. Simply put, an aging Imran Khan made compromise that were necessary to attain power. And finally, last August, at the age of 65, he assumed the office of Prime Minister. But the PTI of today is unrecognizable from the PTI when it was founded, with one major exception, Imran Khan. He still leads and controls the party. Here is Musharraf Zaidi, again, addressing the question of the compromises Imran made on his path to power. A lot of that shine began to wear as he became more and more entrenched in, in Pakistani politics, not because of anything particularly wrong with his message, but simply because over, over the course of his political career, he became more and more burdened with the compromises that, that politicians often have to make, especially those politicians that, that really, really want to be in power. Today, as prime minister, his closest allies, biggest supporters, all tend to be from the same sort of crop of politician that in many ways he's opposed for many years. So I think this, this stark contradiction between prime minister Imran Khan circa 2019 and, you know, the heroic, idealistic Imran Khan circa 1996, that, that contradiction is really, I think, profound, difficult for some people to get over. But I think for most of his supporters, they really like the idea of him at least having an opportunity to be in that position of executive authority and to, in, in many ways, bulldoze his good intentions into executive action that overcomes the kind of classical dirty politician tricks and games. So now that Imran is finally in power, is he capable of reforming Pakistan? Does he have the space to operate? And is he able and willing to go up against the various interest groups who shape how policy is? is made in the country. Here's Musharraf again. Every emergence of a new power center within Pakistani politics has to make, I think, two or three key compromises. The first is that they have to they have to make good with the country's military and security establishment. They have to be on side. And at different points in time in Pakistan's history, that's meant different things. But in the main, it's really been centered around, I think, the quite legitimate concerns Pakistan has and the Pakistani army has about India's behavior behavior both in the region but specifically with respect to Pakistan. I think the other big compromise that, that Pakistani politicians have to make if they want to see the seat of power is the ability to work with politicians in the Punjab who are classical patronage politicians. Those folks will have to be allies. If you make enemies of those folks, you're going to find it real rough going to come into power. And I think the third compromise is to make peace with the fact that Pakistan is a net borrower. The U.S. is going to have certain advantages and relationship with Pakistan, the IMF, the Saudi Arabians, the Chinese, all these countries are going to have certain advantages in their relationship with Pakistan because Pakistan is a net borrower and, and finds it real difficult to make do with, with the resources at its disposal domestically. Now, politics at its heart is a battle over resources. In the words of political scientist 
Harold Laswell, politics is the contestation over who gets what, when, and how. In Pakistan, those questions are to a large degree answered for, not by the Prime Minister. Over 50% of Pakistan's federal budget this fiscal year will go to debt repayment and defense expenditures. Meanwhile, the federal and provincial governments spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year subsidizing inefficient industries like sugarcane, which are dominated by political or politically connected elites, including some members of Imran Khan's political party. Agriculture is a major sector in Pakistan, but it's not directly taxed, and at the same time, it is heavily subsidized. And this is one reason why Pakistan has a low tax-to-GDP ratio of 11-12%. to Now, the common man in Pakistan pays a good amount in indirect taxation, but the elite, including politicians, avoid paying their own fair share of direct taxes. They benefit from selling basic goods to a captive market of 200 million people, and they get subsidies and tax exemptions from the government, of which they're often a part. And this is not simply an issue of pork barrel politics. Pakistan, to put it quite bluntly, is a poor country. It has one of the world's highest infant mortality rates. 25 million children in the country are out of school. 45% of its children are afflicted with stunted growth, and it ranks among the top countries in the world with lowest access to clean water. Imran Khan is well aware of the dismal quality of life in Pakistan. Some of the data we've just shared is actually from his inaugural address to the country after winning last year's elections. And so it's quite clear that the new Pakistan that Imran Khan wants to build is being held back by the old Pakistan. And that old Pakistan is very much infused in his own political party. Now, another set of problems, according to Musharraf Zaidi, is that Imran's diagnosis of what ails Pakistan, his almost singular focus on corruption, and his recent embrace of austerity are fundamentally flawed. He isn't really seemingly capable of much more than continuing to make various compromises so that he can be prime minister. Uh, unless his country grows for over a decade at uh, 8 to 13 percent per annum, it's not going to be able to escape the cycle, uh, the boom bust cycle that it's been that that it's been stuck in for 70 years. And unfortunately, the response of every regime to an economic crisis is to is to whittle down. Austerity makes sense when you are a highly developed economy that isn't going to grow at more than two to three percent a year just because of the levels of saturation within the economy. But austerity makes no sense whatsoever when you have a country that is continue that is going to continue to get younger and younger for an another 25 years potentially, a country that has not begun to exploit its economic potential, a country that hasn't yet begun to take advantage of the connectivity opportunities available to it because of the unique confluence of civilizations and economies that it's really a central hub for. When you have a country and an economy like that, the notion of austerity is suicidal. Imran Khan's first experience in government has been accompanied by what I would call an austerity program that he really had nothing to do with that was kind of given to him. Unfortunately, rather than challenging what was given to him, he took the advice of, of the kind of people that have been at the center of these kinds of austerity programs for at least two or three cycles uh, over the last 30, 40 years. And every single time these, these austerity programs have failed to do what they're supposed to have done, which is to fix Pakistan's, essentially, its its biggest domestic problem, which is its budget deficit. Pakistan simply has much greater needs than it can pay for. That's not really going to get solved because of an anti-corruption campaign or because you throw a few politicians into jail. And that's not really, at, at its heart, a corruption problem. That is a problem of not taxing the right people at the right rate. It's a problem of the entire state being captured by the elites, many of whom happen to be part of the cabinet, part of the inner circle of Imran Khan, and part of the, the friends and family package that accompanies most most of the Pakistani elite. And sadly, on that front, Imran Khan is no different from any of his predecessors. Now, Pakistan has a parliamentary system, and Imran Khan's political strength is tied 
to his party's numbers in the National Assembly. His party lacks a majority there and rules as part of a shaky coalition government. And so the change he's promised to a large degree will require working with the machine he's raged against for over two decades. Transformative change, where Pakistan sees a steady, sustained and rapid rise in economic growth can only come through reform, buttressed by the support of other political elites. An IMF bailout is imminent and it will come with strings attached. The IMF will require the further phasing out of subsidies and the privatization of state-owned companies, which have been stuffed with political workers from the other major political parties over the past three decades. Inflation will reach double-digit territory for the first time in a while, and so there will be many disgruntled people on the streets. It is critical for Imran to be able to push back against pressure from the IMF and its fellow travelers in Pakistan, some of whom are now part of his cabinet. They'll push for fiscal balance at the cost of economic growth. To make these tough decisions, Imran Khan will need to forge a political consensus, but he's built his political career on the premise that the other parties are part of the problem and not the solution. And so in the view of Salman Masood, for Imran to make that transition to become a consensus builder will be no easy task. I, I think it will be a constant tightrope walk and because he does not have a majority in the parliament, he's dependent on his coalition partners and the economic conditions are not very favorable. So there will be a lot of disgruntlement both on the street and in the parliament. The parliament will continue to be a place where there will be less legislation, there will be much more political mudslinging and basic objective that is, you know, passing legislation, it will be, it will be on the back burner. So there's, a, there's a very big statement right now. And uh, we're, we're eight months into 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 this government, into this parliament, and there's hardly any legislation that has been passed. I, I don't think Imran is interested at all. He has not gone to the parliament much. Even in the last parliament, he he, he was one of the, those members who, who probably attended just a few sessions in like the whole five-year term. And even right now, he's not interested in this whole parliament uh, legislation and parliamentary process. And also, you know, like to build a consensus, you have to work with the opposition. And Imran has taken a very extreme position that all po uh, political opposition is corrupt and they need to be jailed and hanged. Uh, he's not willing to work with uh, Nawaz Sharif's party. He's not willing to work with People's Party. And when you don't have any a majority in the parliament, so how can you pass the legislation when there is no consensus? Relations between the army and Imran Khan are seen right now as being free of drama. But there are signs that their patience with him is not infinite. There's been chatter about the need to replace the parliamentary system with a more centralized presidential system. And some have called for rolling back the 18th Amendment, which devolved many powers held by the federal government to the provinces. There's already been a major shakeup in Islamabad, possibly involving the army. In April, there was a massive reshuffle of the federal cabinet with the sacking of the finance minister, Asad Umar. The army, it's said, is unhappy with the management of the economy. Here's Salman Masood again. Imran himself has, I mean, he's not lost his shine. You know, people still think that he is honest and he's trying to make a difference. But if the impression that his team is incompetent or they're not up to the task, if that gets much more resonance, then I, I think it will be very difficult for even the military establishment to keep looking the other way. Right now, they see him as a, a person who's not corrupt, who's honest in his intentions. Uh, if there's this sort of a free fall, I don't think they, they I think they'll start looking for other options. And there are many people who feel that because you're so dependent on your coalition partners and there's this constant push and pull, no party has an absolute majority. So this this system is not really working right now. As far as the presidential system is concerned, there has been this fascination with this system of governance for a very long time. Back in the 50s and 60s, when Pakistan was ruled by some presidents, there's an impression that things were better at that time. But I don't think constitutionally that is that easy to change the whole system, but this thing has been discussed within the borders of power as you said, and the you know, our military establishment. It seems pretty, I would say, amenable to this model. Uh, now, how does this change come about? That remains to be seen. But yeah, there, there is this concept that we need to have a presidential system or something similar in which, you know, one man has the power and he's not blackmailed in a way by his coalition of partners. 
even right now i don't think if you somehow you manage to introduce this, this presidential system it will, it will not offer any quick fixes because these structural problems in pakistan and the governance issues they cannot be just sorted out by having one person and i, I think the reform then there needs to be you know reforms have to be all across the board so i i think this uh, this debate in pakistan right now about a new form of government is just because this experiment of having a very charismatic outsider kind of a politician at the helm is not really working out. So Imran Khan's first nine months in office have been less than stellar. Salman Masood has interviewed him on numerous occasions, including after he became prime minister. And he says that Imran has a more sober view on how to achieve change in Pakistan, but he remains a fighter. I think he's much more serious and somber now. He realizes that the expectations of the people and the benchmarks that he set for him himself it was so high that achieving it so soon is is you know impossible and people not really willing to wait like a year or two so that there's an added public pressure and as we discussed you know the whole dysfunction which exists in, this, in the system right now that also hampers uh, his ambition but uh, you know he he's a very uh, determined resilient kind of a person so and, and he never gives up and even right now he's drawing a lot of strength from his past experience and that's why he quotes a lot from his cricketing days when you know initially when he started he could not even make it to the national team but then gradually he developed and worked on himself and became one of the best cricketers in the world and he himself says that when he came up with this idea of a cancer hospital which would treat the poor free of cost people thought that it was not feasible but now we have you know several cancer hospitals under his shaukat khan memorial trust so you know he draws that strength but politics is a very difficult messy game it's not dependent on just one person politics is indeed not just about one person it requires a strong team and unlike the field of sports it often even requires working with one's rivals but politics and sport both demand grit and determination the kind of grit and determination that Imran Khan and the Pakistani national cricket team displayed in 1992 and so as Imran finds himself again with his back to the wall as he seeks to transform a troubled country of 200 million people we close this podcast with a guide he gave his team of underdogs in 1992. Imran, I thought you were the line of law. What's this? Well, uh, this is what I've been telling Alan that I want my team to play today like a cornered tiger, you know, when it's at its most dangerous. Yeah.